Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at verse 10. We're going to look at the first, the, the next eight verses. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. Paul writes, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having gird your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, for which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Father, thank you for your Word today. On this Father's Day, I pray that you would open up our spiritual ears and our hearts. Lord, today we just declare that our heart is good ground. And Lord, I pray that that seed would go in there and produce uh, 30, 60, and 100-fold results today. Let it overflow in our life. Let the fruit be evident by what you do by faith in your word. Lord, we thank you for it, and we ask it today in your name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Now turn to somebody beside you real quick, real quick, real quick, and tell them good morning. Now turn to somebody else and say, you were my second choice, but good morning. Now I hope you didn't hurt anybody's feelings. Amen. Well, hallelujah. We're so glad to be in God's house this morning on this wonderful, wonderful Father's Day morning. What a beautiful day it is, and uh, we're excited to be there. David said, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. So we're excited uh, to be here uh, in this place. Last week, if you were here, uh, this is always my little shameless plug or commercial. If you were not here, you have access to go back and listen, to watch whatever, whatever platform. If you want to look at it on Facebook, or YouTube, or Podbean, go back and listen and catch up. Because I tend to, to teach kind of methodically in sermon series. And so I try to recap the best I can. But uh, oftentimes you'll miss something if you don't go back. But I'm telling you, this series right here is going to bless your soul because I believe that God wants you to have victory. Now, Jesus already purchased our victory, but it's evident that not everybody's walking in their victory. And so uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about it. We've been talking about beyond the veil. Last week, I took you into the Old Testament passage in Kings where Elisha and his servant were asleep in the middle of the night, and the king of Syria came down with his horses and his chariots and went to overtake them. And the servant of God woke up early in the morning, and as soon as the sun hits his eyes, he looks out and he sees all of Syria's uh, horses and chariots and all of those things that are out there, and he begins to get what? Overwhelmed. He begins to panic, if you will. And uh, we talked about that, how when we look at what we can see, it's easy for us to get overwhelmed by the circumstances in life, by situations that happen. But we learned that Elisha prayed and said, God, open his eyes that he might see. And beyond the veil of our flesh, God opened up the realm of the Spirit, and the servant of God with his wide eyes looked, and he saw in the hilltops chariots and horses of fire, just like the one that took away his predecessor, Elijah. And here's what he said. He said, there are more that be with us than they that be with them. And that servant left encouraged. In fact, they didn't even have to fight because Elisha prayed and the Lord smote the enemy with blindness where they could not overtake them. What did we learn last week? We learned that the spiritual realm is very real. We learned that man is inherently a spirit being. We were created in the image of God. We are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. And when we die, right, when we pass on from this life that is our flesh, if Jesus doesn't come back first, our flesh ceases to be. Our spirit goes on to either heaven or hell because we are spiritual 
beings. That's the way God created us. Then we also looked and saw that not only were we created as spiritual creatures, we learned that God also created angels. We looked at how Hebrews says we may be entertaining angels unaware. We, we talked about some roadblocks about angels. We were, uh, talked about how we're not to have an unhealthy fascination with that. We're not to pray to the angels or anything crazy new age like that. But we're to be aware that they are working in our lives and in our midst. And counter to that, we talked about demons and demon spirits. And we also learned that Jesus' first demonic encounter that's recorded in the New Testament didn't happen at the honky-tonk. It didn't happen uh, at some place like that. It happened in the synagogue. Amen. It happened in a church setting, which means you can be religious and not be saved. Amen. People, people are like, I'm spiritual. And I'm like, so? Demons are spirits. I mean, you know. Uh, define yourself. Amen. Define yourself. And so we learned that the spiritual realm is very real. This morning, I want to talk to you about faith for the fight. Faith for the fight. See, I don't think that it would take much persuading at all this morning for me to persuade you that we're in a spiritual fight. We're in a spiritual fight in our nation right now. We've got this... um, Sexual debauchery taking place in the month of June, the uh, LGBTQ plus YZ, whatever. I've just redefined it. I've decided that uh, it stands for lettuce, bacon, tomatoes, uh, guacamole, and queso. Amen. That's what, that's what, it, that's what it stands for for me. But uh, I can't speak for anybody else, and the rainbow belongs to God, and, and it's a promise of his covenant. But we we live in a world where there's a fight, indoctrination, kids' cartoons, Buzz Lightyear, all these different types of things that are going on. We're in a fight with our nation. Are we going to be a a, a nation that stands on God's values? We're in this war, but we're not only in a war in a nation, we're in a war just in general, in the natural realm. I don't know if you know this this morning. I know you do, but I want you to know that you know that you know you are in a fight. Whether Now, let me clarify this. Whether or not you're a Christian or not, you're in a fight. And this morning, that fight looks a little different, but the end game is still the same. And so I, I want to help you this morning realize how to get the victory. There are many different pictures. God speaks in pictures. He speaks in imagery. There are many different pictures that paint who we are as the people of God. For instance, in the New Testament, we're, we're called a, a, uh, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, which means a called out legislative assembly. It was a, a word that was used in biblical days, which means when you and I gather together under the same roof, worshiping God, praising God, we are doing kingdom business. Our worship is warfare. Our, our giving is doing supernatural things. All of the things that happen when we come together are amazing and so God refers to us as a a called out chosen assembly we're we're called the family of God we're called um, you know the house that God is building and one that always gets me is we're referred to as the bride of Christ it's the only time I'm really cool with somebody calling me a bride amen you know, it took forever for me to kind of get over that. It's kind of a little weird, but I know it's just an analogy. But uh, we're called the bride of Christ. But one of the more powerful pictures of the church that Paul gives us in the book of Ephesians is that of an army. We are a part of an army. Now, the thing about it is, in the, um, in the army of the Lord, you, listen to me. In the army of the Lord, there's nobody that's been drafted. Nobody has been drafted in the army of the Lord. In the natural army, some of you may remember in, the, in different branches of the service that there were times when war was going on. You were drafted. You were called out. You didn't have a choice. You left home. You signed up. You went and served your country. But it's not so with the kingdom of God. All of us who are in the army of God are in that because we have signed up. That's why Paul said, I am a bond servant to Jesus Christ. A bond servant is somebody who will chooses to serve their master so you and I are in this army called the army of the Lord 
Now, what we have to understand is, is if we have an army, we have to ask, why do we need an army? Why does God's people need an army? And I want to tell you the answer is extremely plain today. It's plain as the nose on your face. We need an army because we have an enemy. We have an army because we have an enemy. See, long, long time ago in eternity past, there was an angel that had fallen and rebelled from heaven named Lucifer. He was the son of the morning. And he was banished out. His, his authoritative position in heaven was, was cast out. And he was not able anymore uh, to, to do his previous things. So he was banished to the earth. And we see him in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent. And this, this enemy is one whom all throughout the Bible we see as our adversary. There are different names. There's Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. Listen, every time I see flies, and, and you know, we live in a town that's full of agriculture and cows and everything, and you know, flies means there's mess. Can I tell you the reason why the devil's referred to as Beelzebub is because all he does is spread mess. That's one of the reasons why he's named that. So it's, there's Beelzebub, there's Lucifer. The Bible calls him so many different names. But one of those names is the adversary. And I like the way 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says it. Look at it. It says that our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Our adversary, the devil, roars about like a, wanders about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What I need you to get is that the adversary is walking around sniffing and trying to find somebody whom he consume, can consume. The thing is, this morning, you have to make up your mind that you're not going to be edible by the enemy. Closing doors, tearing down strongholds, all of those things, because if not, the enemy has an access point into our lives. See, we, we can't forget that even though we live in the power of the cross, right? The cross was a perfect victory. Satan was defeated on the cross. All sin was covered on the cross. But we forget that though we live in the power of the cross, listen to this, you might want to write this down. Not only do we live in the power of the cross, we also live in the tension of the cross. Say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, we live in the tension of the cross because, yes, Jesus paid for all sin, but everybody's not saved. Right? We're still in a fight. There is a future reality that we are tapping into in the here and now, but we still live in the tension of the cross. So, yes, Satan is ultimately defeated. Satan's demise is into the lake of fire forever and forever and forever. But I have some news for you right now. Some of you may not even realize this because I hear people get mad. They get mad at the devil and they say things like this. And, and, and please understand, I'm not, I'm not cursing this morning, but people say this about the devil. Well, you can just go back to hell where you belong. He's never been there. Satan's never been to hell yet. That doesn't happen until the end. There are demons. The book, of, uh, the book of Peter tells us that there are some angels who rebel, who are held in Tardis, a compartment under the earth, in everlasting chains and judgment. So there are some demons that are bound in hell. That's why people have these dreams about going to hell, and they say they saw the devil. I said it wasn't God, because he's not there. It's not there. He has he is, he is, uh, got a present Reality where we are right now. So we have to ask ourselves the question. If he's not in hell, where is he? He's on the earth. Now here's the thing. Satan is not omnipresent like God is. He can't be everywhere at one time. Right? So people are like, all, all, the same people all the time. Who the devil has been after me all week? You're not that special. He's looking for the Antichrist. He's, he's over there hanging out by him. So whenever he decides to slip over the roll, he can jump in his body. Satan is a spirit being. Yes, he is. But he's not everywhere at the same time. But he does have demons that carry out his work throughout the earth. And demon possession is no joke. It's a real thing. I've experienced it. I've seen it. I've took authority over demons. We've seen them cast out. It's a really, really, really crazy thing. I hope you never have to see. But it's, it's true whether you want to or not. It's there. 
Um, but what we have to understand is that our adversary, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion. All of this is pre, pre-sermon, pre-notes. So when Satan comes before the throne of God with, with uh, Job, they say, uh, you know, he's standing before the hosts of heaven. He says, where have you been? He says, walking to and fro the earth, in the earth and up and down in it. You know, Satan geographically fell in a certain place because one of the churches in Revelation, uh, one of the seven churches, it says that, that uh, I know where you are even where Satan's seat is. Most theologians believe that Satan literally, when he cast down to the earth, he fell to a geographical place. So listen to me this morning. We do have an adversary. Now, I'm not going to spend my whole morning building up the adversary, but I don't want you to be foolish enough to think that you're not in a fight. You say, Pastor, what's the fight about? It's over your soul. It's over your soul. You are always in a fight over your soul. There's a fight over your marriage. There's a fight over your kids. There's a fight over your destiny, fulfilling what God has called you to do. And Satan, although he is defeated as far as at the end of all things, we live in this tension and this present reality where he's going to do all he can and unleash the powers of the kingdom of darkness to attack you and to try to bring you down. Ultimately, his goal, right? If you're lost, Satan's goal is to drag you to hell. If you're saved, Satan's goal is to cause you pain, suffering, torment, and ultimately for him to try. It's hard to do, but to try for you to turn your back on God eternally. Now, it's very difficult, but you and I have to realize there is a fight. Now, let's, let's look at this. And I want to I get into this before we get into our main message. There are cycles of testing. There are, there are times in our life where we feel like we've employed the battle plan. We feel like we have uh, imposed the strategy. And all of a sudden, we feel on top of the world. But we fail to prepare for those moments where the adversary comes back. You say, oh, I don't know about that. Let me, let me take you to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Listen, I love John. I love Paul. But we really have no greater example than Jesus, right? The end of Luke chapter 3, John baptizes Jesus. You know the story, Luke chapter 3, verse 16. I tell everybody, you memorize John 3, 16. You really ought to memorize Luke 3, 16. It's just as important or not more. For there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus was baptized by John at the end of Luke chapter 3, and he goes down into the water. The heavens open up. God makes a public declaration. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove, rests upon his shoulders, and then the very next thing says, and he was driven by the Spirit into the Judean wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan came and he tempted the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the two-legged, two-armed Son of God in human flesh. You say, well, you know, I got all victory. Listen, even Jesus was tested by the devil. He came to him and he tempted him in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Tested him with food. He said, because he, he had fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. He said, if you be the son of God, turn the stones into bread. Then he took him up to the pinnacle of the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give this all to you. And he also said, if you cast yourself down from here, he said, it's written. And, and he misquoted scripture right here, by the way. He said, it's written, he'll give his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot against a stone and he'll bear you up. And, and what did Jesus say? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written, it says. And here's what the Bible says, that the devil left him. There's no period there. It says for a season. It says for a season. The reason why some of you are going through cycles of struggling, whether or not it's dishonesty or lust or something in your life that you say, God, if you help me, I'll never do this again, is because you don't prepare the offensive plan for when the enemy comes back to your life. Are you still with me? 
This is heavy stuff today. This is heavy stuff today. You can't get this everywhere if you, if you don't like it. There might be something more toddlerish for you. But this is meat and potatoes today. The enemy is not playing games with you. It's time for the church to, to put away the Noah's Ark coloring uh, book with the pencils, amen, and put our spiritual big boy and big girl boots on and really deal with this real devil because he's not just coming after you. He's coming after your house, your kids, your property, everything you have because he knows that his time is but short time. I'm telling you, we've got to get engaged in the battle plan. There's cycles of testing. It says angels came, ministered to Jesus, and then guess what? There was some other time where Satan came back and tried to tempt him again. That's why, folks, listen, when we have struggles in our life, we need to employ the strategies. We need to stay free from those struggles, but understand we can't let our guard down because Satan always tries to come again and try to come again. And try to come again and try to entangle you into sin or strongholds or things of that nature. It's very, very important for us to realize. So I want to look at our text again this morning. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, which he founded, um, uh, just about the nature of the battle that they're in. And Paul begins to talk about this, this intense struggle that we all go through as believers. And I love what he says in uh, verse number 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he tells them what to do about it. Put on the whole armor of God. And he goes and he walks through all of that. And then he says, you know, our fight is not a physical fight. We're not wrestling against the flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Those are all the demonic orders of influence in the evil kingdom that he's listing right there. Just as you would rank out the listings in an army, he's ranking those out and saying, here's what we're dealing with. He starts off with principalities. Everybody say principalities. Principalities. Now, it's an Old Testament scripture, but I can give you a New Testament reference. Daniel, when Daniel began to pray when he was in Babylonian captivity, guess what? The angel, it took him like 21 days to come because he said, I was met in battle by the prince of Persia. Now, that was a spiritual being. There wasn't a natural person fighting Daniel in Babylon or the angel in Babylon. It was a spiritual stronghold. That's principalities. Those are, those are spiritual beings that are over regions. Do you know that there are strongholds over regions and over nations? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are some parts of the U.S. that have witchcraft strongholds. When you go to New Orleans, you can sense that. When you go to San Francisco, the whole city is inundated. It's not just a section of town. The whole city is inundated with sexual immorality. There's a stronghold there. If you go to Chicago, people get shot every day, 20, 30 people. Never gets on the news. Murderous things happen. Not, and, and everybody wants to make it a race deal. But there's just as much white on white and black on black as there is cross nation. But there's a stronghold of murder and violence over that place. And so we we deal with that. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness. He begins to nail that down. And then Paul leaves them with some encouragement because he wants them to know that they are able to overcome in this fight. That's why today I've entitled this message, Faith for the Fight. Do you know why you need faith for the fight? Because Paul also called it the fight of faith. You ought to fight the good fight of faith. So if you're taking notes or you're looking at the notes, there are a couple things that I want you to write down this morning that will be encouragement to you. Number one, number one, number one, we have a commander that we can trust. We have a commander that we can trust. Notice in verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The reason why we can have faith for the fight this morning is because we're not fighting in our own strength. If you try to fight the devil in your own strength, you will never, ever win. In fact, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, cursed is the man who leans on the arm of the flesh. If we're being honest, a lot of times it's our flesh that gets us in the fight. Amen. And so if the flesh got you in the fight, the flesh will not get you out of the fight. We have a commander we can trust. He has never, I want you to say never, he has never lost a battle. 
If you get the Lord on your side, I'm telling you, there's not a battle you're going through. If you do things his way, that he can't overcome. See, we can be thankful this morning because we have a commander that we can trust. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, it's not, it's not easy to put on a smile when you're going through a fight. You know, when you go through Walmart, you can just about tell, and I say Walmart because that's a public watering hole, it's a gathering place. I could say Walgreens, but everybody doesn't go there, they go to Walmart. So Walmart, you know, you go there and um, you can always tell when somebody's having a bad day, right? Frown on the face. You know, you understand when you ask somebody, hey, how you doing? That's really a pleasantry and not a question. Because if we're all honest, we don't want to stop and hear all of it. I'm, listen, folks, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I'm telling the truth. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? But some people, you know, it's, and they're, you know, maybe they don't have anybody to talk to. So I'm not faulting that. I've been there. You've been there. Everybody's been there. But here's what we've got to understand. If our strength is in the Lord, we've got to understand what Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That means you can be happy in the midst of battle. The joy of the Lord is is my strength. Paul, we're talking about Paul a lot. Wednesday night, come to uh, our Bible study. I'm in Acts 9. I'm talking about the conversion of Paul this Wednesday night. Paul is in a Philippian jail cell. Stocks, bonds, dark, no window. It's an old cistern that's been dried up. And Paul pins these words, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Folks, let me tell you something. The reason why we can be happy in the middle of a battle, even though we don't feel like it, even though we can't see the victory, even though everything around us doesn't seem like it's the way it ought to be, as I said last week, there are always more things happening than we can see. My prayer for you is the same prayer that Elisha prayed for his servant. Lord, in the middle of their struggle, open up their eyes that they can see, and I pray that you would see that there be more fighting for you you than against you we have a commander that we absolutely can trust here's the next thing we see this we have a commander we can trust number two we have a defeated foe now I know it doesn't seem like he's defeated because he does have a little bit of leeway down here but I want to tell you a little secret okay I want to tell you a little secret. Now, don't, this is not a secret that I want you to keep. This is a secret I want you to tell everybody, okay? You're going to tell anyway, so you, come on now. You tell somebody these days, hey, I got a secret. And then, okay, well, I told two or three people, but I, they won't tell anybody. You know, that's what you said. Anyway, uh, here's a secret you can tell everybody. As far as the believer goes, Satan has no authority in your life unless you hand it to him. Unless you hand it to him. Now, I don't believe Christians can be demon-possessed. In fact, the word possessed is not even in the New Testament Greek. It's demonized. But I'm talking about a spirit inside controlling a person like the Scripture talked about, throwing him into the fire, throwing him into the water, epileptic seizures, those type of things. But Christians indeed, indeed, don't make any mistake about it, can be um, influenced and oppressed by devils happens all the time how does that happen happens by opening little doors of access little doors of access as American people and as Christians hear me out now we're extremely good at compartmentalizing our life you can have my Sunday you can have my Wednesday and some people might even say, oh, you can have my money. You can, you can have my tithe. You can have my worship. But you can't have my bad movies. You listen to it, entertain it. All of a sudden, what happens? The enemy starts taking blocks from his kingdom, right? He's stacking them up. You know what that's called? The stronghold. When an enemy walks into a, a territory that he overcomes, one of the ways you know he's been there is he sets up a stronghold. It's a place where he keeps his weaponry. 
thoughts, ideologies, mindsets. I said it, I said it last week. I'll say it again. It was pretty strong, but I'm, I'm okay with that. We watch things on, on, we let things entertain us on TV that we would not let come into our living room and entertain us. And we say, oh, it's just television. It's not a big thing. Now, listen, I'm not a close-line preacher. That's not how I operate. I believe conviction of the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. But I'm telling you, there's some things as believers, some language, some situations, some things that purposely we should not subject ourselves to. We should not do it. It gives an avenue for the enemy to come into our lives. Can't tell you how many people I've known through the years that have gotten messed up by, by reading romance novels. They had a good marriage. They started reading them. All of a sudden, they started getting these thoughts. And uh, See, we think this lust thing is just a man's problem. Ah, you're wrong. Because it wasn't men going to watch Fifty Shades of Grey. Come on, somebody. Give the enemy an avenue into your life. And listen, let me tell you, if you give the devil an inch, he'll try to become your ruler. And if you give him a ride to sweets, he's going all the way to Oklahoma City. That's just the way he operates. We have a defeated foe, but the only authority Satan can have in our life is if we give him an avenue. And this morning, you have to make a conscious decision to shut them doors. You got to shut them doors. The devil is a defeated foe. Listen, the, there's no possible way that Satan can have a long-term victory in your life because he's already been defeated. However, his victory is only, his apparent victory is only temporal in this temporary realm. So that fact should make us realize this. Satan has a big bark, but a really small bite. In fact... In the Old Testament, I believe, I don't have the reference on me, but I believe it's in the book of Ezekiel, the, the prophet says, and when we look upon him, will we say, this is the one who tormented the nations. Satan has a bigger bark than he does bite. I want you to think about it. We have a defeated foe. You can have faith for the fight today because you can realize Satan has already been defeated. And all, so what does that mean if Satan has already been defeated? Then what that means is that you have to rise up and assert your authority over his kingdom. Right? All right. Y'all still with me? Can we go just a little bit more? We have a defeated foe. Here's number three. We have a defense that is impassable. We have a defense that is impassable. They don't have this scripture up there, but I want to read it to you today. I quoted it last week as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into subjection and until our uh, disobedience is um, brought into the line of God. It's an amazing thing. I said Satan has no access into our lives unless we allow him to. Now notice this. He says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I don't know how many times I can keep telling you this. You cannot fix the problem in your flesh. Won't happen. Fleshly results uh, or fleshly problems will turn out fleshly results. And if you try to fix it in the flesh, it'll end up in the flesh. This is a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual fight. You say, yeah, but it's not, my, it's not a spirit I'm fighting. It's my neighbor. It's my boss. It's whoever. Well, could I, could I just encourage you today that that's why you have to learn to love people past their issues and get to the root of the issues but the enemy will have you hating people. All of us, saved or unsaved, are image bearers of God. We were all created in his image. We're not all God's children, but we are all God's creation. And God doesn't want us to be fighting against people. In fact, that's why he said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. All right. Let's go here for a second. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the what? 
pulling down of strongholds. Then he tells us how to do that, casting down imaginations. You know why? Because when you begin to allow compromise into your life, it begins to build up a stronghold of imagination. What ifs? What ifs? What if I was married to this person? What if I was married to that man? What if I had this? What if I had that? The enemy starts bringing these things into your life and stacking them there. And it's not just th those things, but it can be wrong thinking about yourself, wrong thinking about who God has called you to be, wrong thinking about the kind of family you were raised in, wrong thinking about the income your family had, wrong thinking about the color you are. It can be all types of things, but the enemy specializes in strongholds. But I want to declare to you this morning, the great thing about strongholds is that they were made to be torn down doesn't matter how long they've been there they're made to be pulled down you say pastor you don't understand I've been dealing with this for 30 years doesn't matter that's a greater testimony well, you don't understand, Pastor. Uh, my dad dealt with this, and my grandpa dealt with this. Well, that's great. It's time to break some stuff. It might have ran in your family. It's time to run out with you. That's what you have to do. We have a defense that is impassable. Let me get through this quickly. Notice there in uh, verse, uh, we look at uh, Ephesians 6. We have a defense that is impassable. He says, therefore, verse 13, take up the whole. Everybody say the whole. I mean, you can't halfway do this thing. There's not a piece of this armor that's optional. And the problem with the modern church today is we think everything God said is optional. Coming to church is optional. Worship is optional. Giving is optional. Everything's optional. So you think you're going to win the fight with an optional mindset? It's not going to happen. Notice what he says. Take up, therefore, the whole. Everybody say it again. The whole. The whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Stop. Stop right there. Look at that. He never promised you a life without problems. That's the first stronghold lie you've got to deal with because you'll go through something and you'll be like, whoo, I thought God was good. Whoo, I thought I was never going to go through this. He never said that. Some shiny hair, slick hair preacher sold you a lie and took your money. That's not what he said. He said, you need to put on the armor of God so that you can withstand in the evil day. He says, stand, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girt up your loins, your waist with truth. Middle Eastern culture today, not so much in America. I wear a belt. My pants fit. If I took off my belt, they wouldn't fall off. But in Middle Eastern culture, that belt was an important part of the garment. Very important. It held everything together. And guess what? It's the truth of God's word that holds everything together in our life. It is our foundation. It is where we start. It is we have to just make sure that we are bound up with truth. Why? Because when you know truth, the enemy can't take advantage of you. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. You say, well, what I don't know don't hurt me. What you don't know is totally kicking your behind. And it is going to continue to do so until you get the revelation of the truth. For you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. Gird up your waist with truth. We got to put on the truth of God's word. Then notice what he says. We got to put on the breastplate. Of righteousness. What was the purpose of the breastplate? It was to guard the vital organs. It was to guard the heart. How I many you know the Bible says, above all things, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. When you remove the breastplate of righteousness and you allow everything to come into your heart, the enemy defies you from the inside. All of a sudden, you're watching, you're listening, you're doing things. You start thinking things you wouldn't normally think. You start saying things you wouldn't normally say. You've allowed the enemy access from the inside. So what do we have to do? We've got to make sure that that breastplate is in its proper place so when the enemy comes and tries to implant something into our lives there's a defense are you still with me the breastplate of righteousness and he says having your your having shod your feet with the preparation 
of the gospel of peace. The Roman soldiers' uh, gear and his army had a certain kind of shoes, and they were not like normal shoes. They were actually driven together by, by nails through the soles, and they were made to go in difficult places. They were made to have traction, to stand in opposition. They were made to stand in slippery places. Can I tell you something? That whenever you gird up your feet, With the shoes of the gospel of peace, it'll help you to stand in sinking sand. Amen. That's the problem. So many people just slide to the left, slide to the right, right? Slide in all kind of places because your feet aren't planted on the word of God. Your feet aren't planted in the truth of God's word. And God wants your feet to be planted so that you can have, notice this, the gospel of peace. Peace, because not only can you have joy in the middle of your battle, you can have peace because he's already won the victory. Hallelujah. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Then he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Romans 10, 18, what's it say? So then faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God. I love the way one writer said, F.F. Bosworth, faith cannot exist where the will of God is unknown. What is the will of God? It's the word of God. You've got to know the scripture. When Je- Listen, when Jesus was attacked in Luke chapter 4, he didn't just twiddle his thumbs. He said, it is written. It is written. And then, the, then Jesus got so irritated Now, maybe he didn't. Maybe that's me reading into it. I can't see Jesus losing his cool. But he got a little bit more demonstrative. And that logos word, the written word, became the rhema word because he said, it says, and man shall not live by bread alone, but by every preceding word from the mouth of God. And notice this. Notice this. Jesus fought the enemy with the word. When he became a fire of dark, he just pulled up the word on him. You know why some of y'all get so smoked throughout the day? You don't have no word in you. You got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Wall Street Journal, Fox, CNN. Help me, somebody. I'm not meddling because I can't see unless the Lord were to see, open the spirit realm and show me your phone or your tablet. But let, let me, let's compare. Let's do a comparison on your word life versus your everything else life. And let's see where your faith is shield has been drawn. See, you either got a little bitty shield like this, or you got a big old shield. And guess what? When the enemy comes, notice it says you'll be able to to quench off the fiery darts. What they did in those days, they took the long darts, they dipped the end in kerosene, they wrapped them, and they shot them into the enemy territory. So not only did they stab something and hurt them, but then it, it caused it to be engulfed in fire. See, the enemy's not playing games here. He's not wanting you to just stub your toe or or cut your foot. He's wanting to demolish everything till you become emblazed. And so he takes those arrows and he begins to fire them off, doesn't he? He does. He does. Can I give you some real life examples? I am hurrying, I promise. Real life examples. Ladies, listen to me. Husband's not treating you right. Always strife in the house. Go to work, man at the office, dress nice, smells good, compliments your hair. What's the, what's the devil do? Vice versa. Cheating on your taxes. Well, you know, Uncle Sam gets more than he's supposed to anyway. But if you don't have the word in you, you can't fight that. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to bring back unto remembrance everything that Jesus has said to us. And so in the heat of battle, when the enemy is coming with his bow and arrow, what happens? Pick up the shield of faith like Jesus. It's written. It says... Not going to happen today, devil. 
Not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not the next century, not the next decade. It is not going to happen. Why? Because my faith, I'm holding up the shield of faith, and I'm not going to allow the bitterness, the offense, the transgression into my heart, into my life. I am fighting this because we have an adversary who is unrelentless. He's unrelentless. But I got news for you. We also have a God who's unrelentless. Whew, hallelujah. All right, I'm moving, I'm moving. Then he says, take on the helmet of salvation. What does the helmet do? You know that, protect your mind, protect your head. Somebody was fussing at me the other day. I won't say any names, Don, Dameron. I was riding around the block without my helmet on, and he said, I want you to protect your noggin, boy. I said, yes, sir. Why? Because if you get in a wreck, it don't matter if you knock your head off. It's pretty important. I had to guard our mind. Be not conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We had to guard our mind from the garbage of the world, the lies of the adversary. And then, notice this, notice this, notice this. Then he says, and then take them the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, what's the difference between the shield and the sword? The, sword, the, the shield you use offensively. Offensively. You're guarding something. But with the sword, and it's a double-edged sword, by the way, it cuts coming and going. With that sword, you use that defensively. You ravage the enemy with it. That's why there's no, there, listen, the two greatest kinds of effectual prayer, can I tell you something real quick, is not whining and complaining about your problems. God hears us, he understands, but he knows about your problems already, right? Scripture says he knows before we even ask. The two greatest kinds of effective prayer that a person can pray, number one, is praying in the spirit or praying in other tongues. The Bible says we're praying out the mysteries and the perfect will of God. And number two, praying the word of God. One of the ways we use our sword in defense and spiritual battle is by praying the Word of God. But you, again, you can't pray it if you don't know it, right? So important. That's why the adversary has attacked our churches across the nations and weakened the preaching of the gospel. We've got to have Bible preaching. It's important. So important. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. We thought we were done. Everybody quits right there. But he's really not finished. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So he says, after you put on your armor on, put on your loin, get your loins girt about, put on your breastplate, get your shoes looking right. He says, get your helmet, get your sword, get your shield. And then you need to pray in the spirit. Right? Pray in the spirit. See, praying in the spirit is not just what you're supposed to do when you get a goosebump on a good song. You're supposed to do that. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of y'all. That's what Paul said. Man, it ought to be. Listen, people ask me, uh, uh, how many languages do you speak? I say two. They say, oh, what, Spanish and English? I say, no, English and tongues. Amen. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. It's, it's, it's awesome. We got to pray in the spirit. So listen, here's how we can have faith for the fight. Number one, we have a commander we can trust. We have a defeated foe. Darren, I'm done. And then number three, we have a defense that is impassable. We have the armor of God. And there's some additional little things, not little things, but there's additional things we can add to that. But Paul was just using an analogy here of the Roman armor. But there's one thing I want to tell you. If you were to look at a Roman a soldier, okay, this is going to set somebody free. I wish I had a real life demonstration Roman soldier's armor has no guard in the back. Because when you turn your back in the midst of battle, you open yourself up for attack. Let me tell you a scripture nobody likes to read. Flies in the face of a lot of people. Here's what Jesus said. No man, everybody say no man. No man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom. It's a fight. I want everybody to close their Bible this morning. 
I could have preached another three hours. I barely scratched the surface, so you got to come back next week. But as you close your Bible, I want to invite you to stand with me. Not only do we have the armor of God, there's some other weapons in our arsenal. We have the name of Jesus. We have the name of Jesus. When you speak that name, mountains tremble, demons tremble. It exhorts authority when you say the name of Jesus. Not only do we have the name of Jesus, but we have the blood of Jesus, which speaks a better thing than the blood of Cain and Abel. We have the blood of Christ. The enemy cannot stand the name of Jesus. The enemy can't stand the word of God. The enemy can't stand the blood of Christ. But friend, I want you to know something. You are in a fight. Some of you young people, you're struggling in your mind. The enemy's trying to rattle your identity. There's other people here, you're struggling in different areas of your life. You say, well, I don't understand. I'm a Christian. That doesn't mean you're not saved. Can't get that through your head enough. You don't have to, you, we're not getting saved over and over and over and over and over and over and over again 13 times. If you get saved 13 times, you probably weren't ever saved the first time. It's not how it works. But I am telling you that the enemy wants to attack you and bring you to a place of giving up the fight. And I want to declare to you that as long as you stay in the fight, you're going to win. Say, well, I'm tired. Draw on his strength. Well, I'm depressed. Draw on his joy. Stay in the fight. For those of you who are saved, listen to me. Satan wants you to abort your destiny. He wants you to abort your call. He wants you to do things that if it were found out, it would ruin your reputation, ruin your testimony, ruin everything. That's what he wants to do. He wants to smear campaign every believer he can. Thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. We pray, we ask for forgiveness. God cleanses us, he washes us, and tells us to keep fighting the fight. But look, here's the second thing I want to talk about. For those of you who are unsaved, Satan's plan and his agenda is to drag you to hell forever. He's going there one day, and he doesn't want to be there by himself. So if he can get people to revolt against God, so be it. One of the most tragic things, and I say this on this Father's Day, is one of the most tragic things. Jesus even said it. He didn't even, people don't even realize what he was saying. He said the day the coming of the Lord comes, he says there will be two will be in the field, one taken, one left. Two in the bed, one taken, one left. You know what that tells me? There will be husbands and wives separated at the coming of the Lord. One taken, one left. Because everybody's not going to heaven. Satan's fight is against your soul. And he wants to drag you to the pit. This morning, every head bowed and every eye closed. The very first group of people I'm talking to, number one, is if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you say, I'm unsaved, Pastor Brad. What does that really mean? I've not surrendered my life to the Lordship of Christ. Folks, your eternal destination is a place called hell. It's a terrible place. And the, the thing is, is that you don't have to go there. Today, it's as simple as an act of faith. Jesus, I acknowledge that you're the Son of God. I acknowledge that you died on a cross. You lived a, sinful li a sinless life, took all of my sins, and you were crucified and buried in a tomb and three days later you rose again and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Now forgive me and cleanse me and wash me. That's all it takes folks. Listen if you're sincere, not if you just utter the prayer but if you're sincere and God knows you're sincere, regeneration will happen in your life. Today, he wants to save you. doesn't matter how bad you've been, how far you've gone, how long the issue has been there. The Lord's mercy wants to touch you today.
So with nobody looking around, if you're in this room, you say, Pastor Brad, I need to give my life to Christ. Today I need to make sure that my salvation is secure and I'm safe in the arms of God. Today I want to make sure that if Jesus were to come or I were to take my last breath, that I would live eternally with him in heaven. And if that's you, say, Pastor, I want to make sure today, I want you to slip up your hand. Slip it up right now, no matter where you are. No matter where you are. I want to give you a moment. I'm waiting for you. I'm looking for you. I'm going to give you the opportunity. Hallelujah. Second thing, I'm talking to every believer in here. Every believer, young people, older people, everybody in between. Say, Pastor Brad, I've been in a fight. I've been in a fight. The enemy's been attacking my mind, my thoughts. Truth be told, I've, 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 I've compromised in some areas. Listen, right now I'm not questioning your salvation, but I'm saying as a believer, you've, you've opened the door to some areas that you know you shouldn't, and the enemy's attacking your mind. He's attacking some decisions that, that you've made because of wrong thinking. And, and today you say, you know what, Pastor? I, I want to close the door on all of that. I want to close that door, and I want to get my armor put back on, and I want to fight the Lord. I want, I want to fight in this army of the Lord and fight the adversary. If that's you today, nobody looking around, I'm going to make you a promise this morning. Number one, I'm not going to ask you what the issue is unless you want to tell me. The second thing, I want to pray God's strength upon you today. So with nobody looking around, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I've been in a fight. And today, I'm stepping back up to the plate. And I will not allow the adversary any access in my life. If that's you, then I want you to slip up your hand. I feel like there's going to be hands go up all over the place. God bless you, young people. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hands up all over the place. Can I get some prayer workers to come just quickly across the front of this church? Keep those hands up. Anybody else? Hands up. I, the enemy is attacking my mind. I'm going through cycles of things. I feel guilty. I say I'll never do it again. Then I do it again. And then I do it again. It's a, re, it's a cycle over and over and over again. Listen, the Lord's grace and his mercy want to help you today. Listen, you can be delivered from that, that oppressive thing today if you just expose it. Get it out in the light. Quit acting like it doesn't exist. That's pride. Pride says, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. Listen, all of us in this room are messed up people aside from the grace of God. And we want to help you today win the fight that you're struggling with. So if you raised your hand right now without another hesitation, without another aspect of, of, of just trying to hold back, I want you to do something very bold today, my dear friend. I want you to step out of your seat and I want you to come meet me. Come meet one of our prayer workers. We just want to pray with you today. Maybe this is the day God saves your marriage. Maybe this is the day the depression ceases. Maybe this is the day that whatever you're dealing with, God in his power helps you through it. So just come. People are coming all